I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to, uh, to sit and take in the solar eclipse at the end of the summer. Anybody catch that at all? Well, several of us did. I, I, there was like all kinds of uh, uh, sort of, uh, publi- not publicity, like excitement, right, about, about the eclipse coming. And I, I don't know what I expected. I, I didn't expect a lot. I was like, we were driving around at the last minute paying way too much money for little glasses to keep us from going blind. And all this stuff, and it was kind of a cloudy morning, and so I kind of went to it just sort of like, hang, I was a bit more or less sort of thinking I'm hanging out with my kids, and we were probably going to walk away being like, eh, that wasn't much to be impressed about. But I really found myself being like mesmerized by the whole thing, right? As we were sitting, there was a group of us that sat out at the Kesslinger campus out in the lawn just watching this thing, and it was cloudy, but you'd get these glimpses of as it was approaching. And you'd see all these dramatic pictures of things that, that you look on on the internet or that you'd heard about. And, and, and yet, when I was there in the moment, it didn't, didn't look like this. It, it was, but it was breathtaking. There was something about, like, I didn't go full, like, Tom Skilling on it, but, but it was an exciting thing for some reason. I was like, wow, look at this. It got a little darker and it got a little cooler. And, and it was interesting because I was thinking about that whole experience. I was like, there's, there's a drastic difference between knowing about something, right? I mean, I, I knew about solar eclipses. I knew information about them. I've seen them um, on the internet. Everybody was talking about it. But, but there's something different than that and experiencing it, right? I mean, that's a whole different scale. That's a whole different impact in, in our lives. And I, I wasn't in the path of totality or anything like that. But the people I talked to who saw it there, it was, it was even that experience just amplified even more um, as you watch this, this phenomenon in nature take place. This, this week, we are going to look at another, another prayer, really, that Paul is going to offer on behalf of the church in, in Ephesus. And if you're new again here with us this morning, we're in the middle of a series entitled Built to Last, where we've been kind of systematically working our way through Paul's letter to this group of Ephesians and this church that he started there. And this this letter really breaks down into kind of two central themes. This first half that we've been looking at really is is a retelling of the gospel story. It it, it has a lot of statements about identity. It's it's, it's Paul sort of re-saying once again, this is what Jesus has done in your heart in your life. And the second half that we're going to start to kind of look into more next week really begins to unpack more of the practical side of that. Like he gets into kind of like what we might call Christian living and what are the implications of the gospel story as it's, as it's lived out in our everyday lives. And last week, as we were starting to look at chapter three together, Paul is just about to launch into this prayer for the Ephesians. But just as he does so, he has this this digression for a bit, and he kind of shares the story or the power of his own experience, the impact of gospel truth in in his life. So he's just about to pray, and as he does, he kind of presses pause for a minute, and he recounts some of what God has done in his life. And if you remember, I, I sort of suggested somewhat speculatively that I think the reason Paul does that is he's established some context here so that they would be able to grasp more fully the power of what he is about to pray for them. So he's sort of reminding them of his own situation, his own circumstances, so so that when they hear the prayer that he's about to offer on their behalf, they're going to have some a fuller context or a fuller understanding of why Paul's praying what he's praying. Which this leads us to Ephesians chapter 3, the second half of this chapter. We're going to pick things up in verse 14 and, and kind of through the, the end of the chapter here. This is what Paul prays for the church in Ephesus. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, 
that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who's able to do more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is an incredible prayer, but before we sort of dive into the specifics of of Paul's prayer here on behalf of the church, I want to take just a moment to kind of just look at a couple observations that sort of um, hit me as we read this together. And first is these beginning words when Paul starts this prayer, just like he did in verse one of this chapter before he kind of has this digression, this pause, he begins by saying, for this reason. Paul's pointing out to the people that that he's already shared with regarding the nature of their salvation and in the impact of God's grace. So the prayer, the context of the prayer is built on everything that he's been talking about in in Ephesians up to this point. In chapter 1, he's talking about their brand new identity. In chapter 2, when he's talking about being saved by grace through faith, he's saying, in light of this, as a result of this, this is... This is what I'm praying for you as the church. Again, he continues to do this in a way that's offering some perspective into his own situation of of suffering as he continues this prayer. Again, Paul's writing this from prison. Additionally, I am, as I was thinking about this and the nature of Paul's prayer, I'm reminded that Paul's writing to the church here. He's writing this to Christians, but what Paul's asking for on their behalf, seems, as I read this, seems to be things that they would have already received. For instance, when he says uh, that, that they would be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. But as Christians, wouldn't Christ already be dwelling in their hearts? In chapter 1, in fact, Paul's already talked about how they've been adopted as sons and daughters, how they've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. So isn't Paul sort of praying for things that that have already happened? And he goes on to pray that they would know the love of Christ. But again, these these are people who've already responded to the message of the Gospel. They've already understood at some level what it is, the love that, that God's showing for him. And so as he prays that, that they would know grace by through faith as he does in chapter 2, isn't this already the case for them and for us? Hasn't this already been realized? And on one level, the answer is, of course, yes. But I also think it, this highlights or illustrates the power of Paul's prayer for the church. Because I think what we're going to discover is that Paul's saying, I don't want you to just know it, or I don't even want you to know it in part. I want you to experience it fully. I don't want you to just understand it intellectually. I want it to be the prevailing truth that impacts and guides your life. So he's praying for for this to increase. So let's take a moment to look at at a few things that Paul prays for specifically. It begins by by Paul's prayer that they would be strengthened. That they would be strengthened. So Paul's purpose here in this prayer is clear. He wants the church to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit so that we will know, we will experience the presence and the love of Christ. Again, Paul prays that that He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. He's praying that Christ would would permeate or that He would rule in every aspect of our lives. Paul's desire, his his prayer for strength is a prayer of receptivity. It's a prayer that that God would make us malleable and shapeable, that the Holy Spirit's work would be unfolding in our lives. That, that phrase that he uses here in these verses where he talks about the inner being, like that, that's a, a, a Greek phrase referring to the sort of the controlling center of our lives. It, it's that place in our lives where life is comprehended and choices are made. So the question that I ask myself when I read that and hear Paul's prayer is if Christ is not ruling there, if he's praying that that would be the case, then what is it that seeks to own that that spot in my own heart and my own life? 
What battles for that place of authority in me? And as I think about this, on the one hand, we could talk about it in terms of, of sort of the general sense of the God of self, right? We talked about this when we were looking at Ephesians 2, where Paul's talking about how we follow the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, and I think it is that. But for me, as, as I'm reading Paul's prayer here, I, I immediately know what that, that thing is in my own heart, in my own life. It's, it's, it's approval. It's that sense that I know that my desire for approval seeks to reign in me so that, that in this sort of uncontested form, I will make decisions, I will make life choices in order to, to discover, seek, achieve approval from someone or someone. I understand that about myself. I can operate out of that. And perhaps for you, it's something similar. Maybe it's not approval. Maybe it is power or success or desire or achievement or safety or control or any number of sort of uh, other inferior versions, these, these, these small g gods that we create, we place in that part of our lives. But Paul's earnest prayer for the church is clear here. He wants the Holy Spirit to strengthen us so that Christ will dwell in that place. And look at verse 17, the beginning half of this again. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through strength. This, this word dwell stands out to me, and, I, and it was really actually kind of critical for, for me understanding the heart of Paul's prayer here. And there are a couple of different Greek words that Paul could have used to talk about the idea of God taking up residence in, in our hearts or our lives, but Paul uses the strongest of the word because it means more than just merely inhabiting. It, 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 and we've already talked about this, that that happens at the point of salvation, but the word that Paul uses here means to settle in. Like it carries with it the implication of of permanence or taking up long residence. So think of it as the difference between visiting and, and even staying for a long time and moving in. Right? When my wife and I moved into Batavia, we bought our house from a couple that had no kids and, and, um, and their house reflected the fact that they had residence there. It reflected their personalities and their style and their taste. It, it looked like they lived there. But over the course of that first year or more, um, and, and we watch a lot of HGTV, so we had ideas, right, going in there. Like, it began over the course of those weeks and months and years more to reflect the fact that we live there. That, that my wife had kind of put her fingerprint on it. And, and walls were painted and decorations were taken down and different ones were we're hung up. You see, this is, this is what Paul is praying for here. D.A. Carson words it this way in his book, Spiritual Reformation. He says, when Christ by His Spirit takes up residence within us, He finds a moral equivalent to trash, black and silver wallpaper, and a leaking roof. He sets about turning this residence into a place appropriate for Him. A home which, where He is comfortable when a person takes up long-term residence somewhere, their presence eventually characterizes that dwelling. When Christ first moves into our lives, He finds us in bad repair. It takes a great deal of power to change us, and that's why Paul prays for power. He is transforming us into a house that pervasively reflects His own character. See, Paul's prayer here is that we would be strengthened in order that Christ Christ might dwell, might reign, might rule in us at the controlling center of our lives, that He would produce His character through our lives. And as He dwells, that you and I would become men and women who are more accurately reflecting our Savior to the world around us. But Paul continues in his prayer here, and in addition to praying that we'd be strengthened, he'd also pray that we would understand that we are loved. He prays that we would understand that we are loved. Paul prays that, that Christ would take up his residence in it and he continues to work in our lives. He wants us to grasp 
how incredibly big the love of Jesus is for us. Look again back in Ephesians chapter 3 at verse 17. It says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. I love the way Paul describes this here. Uh, I, I recently ran across a story of a youth pastor who grew up in the foster care system. And he was talking about how sort of as a, his own sort of protection mechanism, he had been sort of passed through so many houses that that he just intentionally would go into a place with the point of seeing, I, I'm going to see how quickly I can get this family to send me back. Like I, I'm going to intentionally go into this with the idea of just wreaking havoc and see how quickly, it became a game in his mind, to see how quickly he'd get kicked out of a home. And he talks about this, this older couple that, um, that fostered him, became his foster parents, and he, he, was, he said they were easy targets. He said the husband was, was significantly overweight, and on top of that, he was a narcoleptic. And so making fun of him was incredibly easy. It would just be brutal and cruel to him. And, and yet time and time again, they would receive it and continue to love him. He said he, he escalated his plan all the way to the point that he stole their car and, and eventually was arrested. And he thought for sure this would be the thing that said, hey, you know what, we've had enough. We're going to send you back. But he remembers when he had the one phone call, of course, he called his foster parents. And they came to the jail and they paid the bond and they brought him home. And he just remembers the phrase when he said, son, we don't know how long it's going to take, but eventually you're going to understand that you're wanted here. And he talks about like that one moment of unconditional love. How like when all of a sudden he began to understand these people they'd been so cruel to, so angry at for so long that they were going to love him regardless of his behavior, that they were invested in this and there wasn't anything that was going to happen that was going to change that, that drastically changed the course of his life. And here, Paul's prayer for the Ephesians is not that we would love God, although that would be a worthy thing to pray for. His prayer is that they would know that they would experience God's incredible love for them. In fact, Paul goes on to say, I want you to be rooted in your sense of this love. Which is, a, it's an agricultural term, right? Paul's saying, I, I, I want you to get your substance. I want you to be sustained by God's love. I want you to be grounded in it. Which is an architectural term. I want, I want it to be your solid foundation. I want, I want your strength, your stability to come from the realization, the awareness that you are loved. These are, again, Paul's pouring identity statements on them. He keeps doing this. And this is this incredible thing. In fact, as I was thinking about this, from, from a preaching perspective, this is, this is an easy thing to say, but it's a difficult thing to teach. Because on the one hand, it either sounds like cliche, like, hey, God loves you, and that's just like this church phrase that we say, and, and, and maybe we've heard it and it almost doesn't penetrate our hearts. Or it sounds too good to be true. Because our experience of love and the world around us and our human relationships at some level almost always carry some element of condition with it. So Paul even acknowledges this. He says specifically, I want you to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. I want you to know the thing that's unknowable, Paul says. I, I want you to know this love that is so big, so beyond their ability to grasp and I want the Holy Spirit to make it something you understand that you get. In verse uh, 18, he talks about the strength to comprehend. The NIV translates that to, to the power to grasp. It literally means wrestle with. I want you to wrestle with God's love. Paul's saying that we should seek to understand it. And at the same time, it's so extraordinary. So beyond our own capacity to grasp that it takes power to do so. Think for a moment about the original audience that is hearing this some 2,000 years ago. Until they, the message of Jesus had come, their entire understanding of how you could relate to the pagan gods around them was um, 100% on the, the behavior side of things. 
If, if you met their expectations, their standards, then there was blessing. If, if you were disobedient, then there was punishment. So Paul is introducing something that's entirely countercultural. And he says, you are unconditionally, irrevocably loved with an infinite love, an infinite supply of love. In fact, so just try to think about its breadth, its, its length, its height, its depth, because, because like our God, it has no limits. You can't escape it even if you wanted to. Even that part where he talks about together with all the saints, there's this implication there that that's accomplished in community, which is I think is a pretty cool thing. That you and I have a part with each other in understanding God's love. That, 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 that you help me understand how much God loves me. And, and, and when operating according to how He's taught us, that I can do the same for you. That's a, that's a really cool thing. I think it's an incredible thing that He invites community into that. And again, we could go on and on here, but Paul's writing this from prison. So Paul's saying, like, I don't understand God's love in light of my circumstances, which is often what I do. I often think of it if things are going well, God is loving, you know. And if things are going poorly, then I'm like, why is God treating me this way kind of idea. But Paul's, Paul's saying, look, I don't view God in light of my circumstances. I don't understand His love in light of my circumstances. His love informs my circumstances. See, it's the other way around. He flips it. it becomes this well for, wellspring of, of our understanding and relationship with God. And then lastly, I think this is really important, Paul prays that we would be filled. We would be filled. He continues to pray for the church and he says at the end of verse 18, or verse 19, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And here's Paul's heart for the church. The purpose of his prayer, now captured in this phrase, he wants us to be filled to experience the fullness of God. So Paul's desire is that Christ would dwell in us, that He would transform us into His likeness, that we would experience and know the incredible power of His love so that you and I would become everything that God intends for us to be. Think for a moment about, about what you pray for. I think about this passage. I think about what, what is it that I pray for in life. I think about even my own three daughters. I think about this community as Chapel Street Church here at Mill Creek. I think I pray for a lot of really good things. I ask God for His protection. I ask God for His provision. I ask God to be present in this place and, and all these sorts of things. But as I was reading Paul's heart for the church, I began to understand that sometimes maybe I ask for... Maybe sometimes my ask isn't big enough. Because Paul's prayer there is that you would, I would, we would know the fullness of God that He, because of the transforming work of the Holy Spirit, because of His incredible love for us, when He dwells in our hearts, that we would be grown up to, mature to everything that He intends for us to be. Like understand that in the scope of, of how you pray for your kids. I want, I want to pray that for my three daughters. I want to pray that for this community. As we think about being present here, we think about the opportunities that we have, the lives that there are to be able to connect with and relate to you. Like, God, use us as you intended, designed for us to be. There's a, um, a TV show where I saw this encounter, this interaction where this guy's in marketing and, and he's in uh, like design and he has this interaction with Conrad Hilton, who in, in the time, this is like in the 60s, was this multi multi-millionaire and owns all the Hilton franchises and he has this this chance encounter. In fact, he doesn't even know he's talking to at the moment. And over the course of time they build a relationship and and he finally understands who it is that, that he's talking to and he Conrad Hilton shows him some plans that they have for advertising and and the guy kind of looks back at him and says, Well this is what I, I do for a business. He's like, well give me a free one. And so he gives him some feedback on the, the insurance and then Hilton looks back at him and says, what's, what's something that I can do for you? And he kind of thinks for a moment and he says, well, I'd, I'd love a shot at your business. And, uh, and, and Conrad Hilton looks back at him and says, son, when a man like me asks you a question like that, you should have a better answer. 
And I thought, wow, how true, right? How true of the opportunity that we have when we hear Paul's prayer and, and how we understand that instruction and impact in our own lives. Like, I want to pray. I want to make a bigger ask. And look at how Paul concludes here in verse 20 and 21, because this puts, this puts perspective into all of it. It says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, According to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. May we know the fullness of God. Would you pray with me? Father, as we come now, and Lord, as we hear from Your Word and, and have a chance to respond and worship just at, at Your incredible love, if all we can take today from this is that You love us beyond our ability to even understand, Lord, I, I pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, that you would allow that to penetrate our hearts. And in doing so, Lord, as that, as that penetrates our hearts, it would transform us. That the love that we would live out to others would be a reflection of your incredible love for us. Lord, I pray that we would, as Paul prayed for the church here, know the fullness of God. It's in your name we pray.